This is The Cube, live from the Moscone Center in San Francisco. This is SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010. Now, inside The Cube. We're here live back at VMworld 2010, SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage, blanket coverage of VMworld 2010, covering all the angles of cloud. CloudAngle.com is our new site, but we have a, a special guest, Scott Genero from QLogic. And uh, if you follow SiliconANGLE, you know we've been covering these guys in the beginning because they are a small company doing a pretty big thing. They're in the fiber channel business and have a new approach and uh, we're going to talk about it. So Scott, welcome, welcome to the show. Dave Vellante, my co-host, founder of Wikibon.org. Scott, it's good to have you back. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to talk about convergence because the whole show here is about convergence. We've been talking about it for a long time in the industry but with cloud and applications kind of coming together, uh, it's changing the game in the data center. And you guys are a major data center player uh, out there with uh, Fiber Channel, which has been the staple technology for storage. And it's now moving into networking, converging with compute. Um, what's driving convergence? I mean, you're at the, you know, that little ingredient that kind of makes it all work. Your business is changing. Talk about what is convergence. Yeah, so for us, when you're out talking to customers, what's predominantly driving convergence really still comes down to this question of you know, cost related to the infrastructure. You've got a lot of different pieces, you've got a lot of different islands of information, and what everybody's trying to do is they're trying to get to a common stack and simplify the environment. So when you look at that as a whole, you say to yourself, what we're trying to do around convergence specifically as a company around FCOE, fiber channel over ethernet, it's actually a pretty interesting and nice fit when it comes to that. But a lot of it still is driven you know, by that. So you go back and say to yourself that, you know, a while back it was storage, right? You know, how do you consolidate storage down to you know, single footprint, improve environmentals, improve the you know, cost management simplification type information, right? The next came obviously what we're doing here, which is really you know, VMware. Right, virtualization of the servers. So the network convergence is actually really the next step when you kind of look at it. And then when you look at the fact of taking you know, these big pipes, ethernet, combining the two together, it makes a lot of sense. Tom Jordans was on just earlier, he's the CEO of NetApp, and you know, we asked him specifically around virtualization being the core of this, and you just mentioned that. But, but everyone talks about virtualization cloud servers. He brought up that it's the network uh, is, is one fa fact, but storage. And the virtualization has a huge benefit for storage. So talk about uh, where virtualization fits at this storage, as IO is involved, you got devices out there. What, what's your angle on that? Well, I think it comes back down to what we were talking about earlier. I mean, at the, at the very highest level, once again, a lot of this comes down to, I, I, you know, I take a step back sometimes, I think the amount of data that's being created today is huge. Um, I go back and I think to myself that there weren't companies before like Shutterfly and Facebook and all these types of companies that are out there just storing everything. Uh, they say that there's so much data out there that's, being, that's growing, even in the bad economy, people are still storing a ton of data across the board, right? So, similar situation. Consolidation, power, customers still have to figure out how to manage this whole infrastructure, right? And I think that's really key. But on top of it, which I think is important, is this question of, we're saying let's cut stuff up and virtualize it, right? So to do that, you need to make sure, at the end of the day, you have big pipes that are able to you know, manage these infrastructures to go do that. So uh, let's talk about some of the big whales out there, uh, like uh, Google, Facebook. Um, they have huge data centers, they have clusters of servers, they take you know, off-the-shelf servers, virtualize them, they're running you know, Hadoop backends, huge big data. Um, they need to have a new I.O. strategy, fiber channel or a new approach. Um, talk about that and, and also comment on a rumor that I'm hearing that you guys uh, have uh, Google's buying a boatload of your products. Can you comment on that? Um, well, I don't talk about our customers uh, without their permissions, but I will say that most of the large cloud computing companies that are emerging are using our technology in most of their um, infrastructure. For the same exact reason you go back, one of the advantages I think QLogic has as a company is that we're just not a fiber channel company. We have fiber channel, we have ethernet, we have iSCSI, we have InfiniBand, we have it across the board. So when you look at networking protocol, 
these guys still need networking protocol, regardless if they're buying it off the shelf from somebody else, like a you know an EMC or a NetApp or an HP or whoever, or if they're building it themselves. And as you said, a lot of these guys are building their own infrastructure. They're buying stuff off the shelf and they're building it themselves to be able to give them the kind of scalability and the performance that they want to do. Out of all that, they still need this ingredient of their overall solution of IO connectivity. Now, and they're not going to make that ingredient they're themselves. They're not going to make it right? themselves. It's too costly. The, the barriers to enter into that, so they're going to buy it from somebody. One of the things that I think they really like about us as a company is the fact that we have all of it. So it's one company, once again, to deal with. It's not dealing with five different individual companies. And, you know, we talk a lot about FCOE. There's companies that have storage devices that are built on the backbone of InfiniBand, right? There's companies that have, obviously, Ethernet driven. We have all of that technology to be able to build that. So depending on the type of potential niche, because some cloud computing companies, um, regardless of their storage or uh, server centric, some of them focus on SMB, some of them focus on enterprise, and depending on the type of environment they're focused on, might require a different type of protocol. You know, one of the interesting things to me, John, about uh, QLogic and this space in general, I mean, I used to follow the disk drive business many, many years ago when I was at IDC, and these are incredibly complex devices and they, they command, what, maybe 20%, 30% gross margin. Uh, things like fiber channel cards, right? A little card that you stick into a server command 60 plus percent gross margin. So it's, the point is it's really hard to do that stuff. It's not a lot of ton, ton of competition, but the competition is very fierce. And then you've got this extended business that you just talked about where there's a lot more competition, Intel, Broadcom, and folks like that. What's interesting to me is the way in which QLogic, and I want you to talk about this, Scott, is extending its brand. You're not really just a card player anymore. You're becoming more of a, a data center, I'm an arms dealer for the data center right. across the board. Talk a little bit about that. Is that a, a strategy of yours to really extend that brand, or is that sort of just happenstance? No, I, I mean, I think it is a strategy as a company. You know, when, when I came to the company, everyone would say, wow, you're going to a fiber channel company, what are you doing? And I kind of thought it was interesting because we took a step back and said, you know, QLogic isn't a fiber channel company. Don't get me wrong, fiber channel is important. There's a lot of customers out there. We have 9 million ports of fiber channel installed throughout most of the major, you know, enterprise you know, companies around the world. But, you know, there is a convergence going on, right? And it's, you know, fiber channel and over ethernet. We have Ethernet technology. We're one of the leaders in that space. Um, we definitely are an InfiniBand leader. Once again, a lot of hype on InfiniBand a few years ago. You're starting to definitely see it more core. Used to be only HPC type focus, high performance computing. Today, you're starting to see a lot of companies start using it in their applications. You know, Oracle's a great example of that, right? I mean, you know, their high-end database solution, it's very InfiniBand type focused for them as a company. So you're starting to see it go into the enterprise now as, as an application. Um, you know, once again, for us, the advantage is, is that in addition to that, we make ASICs. And by the way, the ASIC is what's the difficult thing of the entry into this market space. It's extremely costly. It's not cheap to go off and create your own chipping, chip technology to do that. We also are one of the few companies that do have a fiber channel stack. One of the keys to a lot of this convergence type technology, especially in the enterprise space, is that there, has to, there is a fiber channel component here. And there's only a couple companies out there that have that, and we're one of those. So I think we have a benefit across the board, but ASICs, boards, and switching. I mean, let's not forget we do make you know, switches and we have that type of technology it, also. You know, Stu Miniman is our newest analyst and he's the one who, he follows this space very closely. He used to be at EMC as a customer. Right. And he's the one who said to me, you know, HK Desai, who couldn't be here, and right. thank you, by yeah, the way, for, for, I, I, for- I apologize for that, he, something came up. Yeah, so, so, but what Stu told me is that HK was a real visionary at the time when early, uh, mid-decade, I guess, he made and others, I guess, made the call to really invest heavily in IP, invest in the silicon. And he said that was the right call because it gave you a strategic advantage. Can you, first of all, talk a little bit about that and talk about what's your vision going forward? What are you guys talking about internally that you can share with us in terms of the vision that HK is driving for the company? Well, I think it goes back to what we were just talking about two minutes ago. And, you know, once again, we want our customers, and I think it's really clear to make sure to everybody that you know our customers is almost everybody who's on the floor here, right? It's the HPs, it's the EMCs, it's um, you know our customer, our first line of customer are the OEMs, right? And then obviously NetApp, yeah, right. NetApp, 
all of them, you know, HP. And from that level... Because they don't do it themselves, you're saying. Well, right? they don't do it themselves, but they're building a solution. And once again, what we talked about earlier, very similar to the cloud computing guys, you know, we have a technology that gets built into the overall solution that doesn't make sense for them to go build themselves, yeah. right? So, and, and that's also... why nobody wants to buy Brocade. Well, that's a whole, <laughs> di that's a whole different <laughs> story. That's on my list. Uh, but, but my point is, is that, um, you know, once again, being able to offer that and complement those customers or partners is really important. We don't compete with our customers. I'm not out there trying to create my own brand to go compete with those customers. You're Switzerland. So we're Switzerland, we're arms dealers as you called it, you know, neutral to everyone wanting to make sure everybody uses our technology in some form. It's a good position to be in. I mean, I think being an arms dealer, if you're neutral and have a value product that's unique like you guys do. Hey John, we're arms dealers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the big trend here at VMworld that's cloud-based, that, that VMware's driving, EMC and all the storage guys are driving is this notion that Virtualization is the center of this massive change, and uh, the stat that's uh, the tipping point is the fact that virtual machines are surpassing physical machines. So, you know, Intel's not going to be happy about that. I mean, that's they're, they're in the hardware business. You're in the hardware business. So, so I think what's interesting is to connect that trend of virtualized machines with physical machines. But you're in the I/O business, and and I'm really intrigued to hear your perspective on this flex fabric. Some of the news you had there. Is that a direct correlation to that trend? Um, are ports going to be virtualized? Are, you know, what does this, all this mean? I mean, people out there who are trying to grok this, uh, explain to them, and explain to us what, what your angle is there. Yeah, so I, I think the first thing that's real important is that sometimes there's a feeling that when you virtualize, that means you'll have a lot less. But the reality is, as we all know, is that when you cut something up into many pieces, right, which is the best way to get the best utilization out of it, and be able to manage that, which is the great piece about virtualization. But you still have this pipe that needs to go access back into the data, right? And there is virtualization and data, but it's the same thing. You've got a bunch of people now, you know, you've got servers here, a bunch of servers, and a bunch of data over here all carved up into virtualizing worlds. But in the middle, you still have this connectivity that somebody has to give them this gigantic pipe, right, to be able to go access that data. So actually virtualization for us actually helps us drive our business. It doesn't actually decrease our business. And I think that's an important message to say. Um, regarding the switching, I think it's an important piece. Virtualization is a reason for that, but also to be fair, this whole converged networking uh, that's going on in the industry, which is a part of virtualization, is really the reason for that. Today, there's this transition going on and customers don't know when they're going to go to it. Right? Yeah. They're not sure if they want to go to it a little. We all know how customers do it. First they go a little, they put it in a sandbox, they play with it, then they want to put it in a test environment. So they've got to go out and buy, a, let's say, a sand switch today, right? So what do they do? Do they buy an all fiber channel switch? Do they buy a FCOE switch and they're not sure when they're going to utilize it? So the solution that we came out with, and by the way, we came out with this with HP, um, they took our technology and implemented it and created a solution, is that we've came out with something called flex ports based on our bullet ASIC. And the advantage there is that you can dynamically change that switch either from an iSCSI to an FCOE to a fiber channel port. So what customers really love about this is the fact that they could technically buy it today and make it all fiber channel. So, uh, and that's and then, and then, wait, hold on. And then three months later as they try to convert, they can take some of those ports and make them FCOE. And some of them fiber channel, and some of them ice scuzzy, That's and they a can game do changer. it. They That's can do it all dynamically. Well, it is and the reason why it's so important. If you look, I just saw some data recently, some from uh, ESG and other from EMC. Actually, Chad Sackett did a survey, and if you look at the protocols that are out there in virtualized environments and VMware specifically, it's like a like a bevy, right? right. It's ice scuzzy, it's FC, it's it's SIFs, it's NFS. I mean, the whole deal, and you guys are. Like you say, the arms dealer to all of those. Dave, yeah. Dave, you know, you're, you've been in the research business for years, IDC now, Wikibon. I mean, doesn't that change the game on like market share reports? I mean, because you got ports, always driven by like ports. I mean, if that's just got this virtual port concept, what, what does that mean? I mean, does that change? I mean, it's obviously end user benefit, you mentioned that, but how does that mean in terms of overall industry structure? Well, we, I mean, I think that we virtualize storage, I mean, servers, we're virtualizing storage, we're virtualizing I.O. now, that's sort of the next, next trend here. And you need that little piece of IP to do that. And so having your own silicon, I think, is a huge advantage. We just saw some Deloro data on FCOE. I think the first time um, the TAM has published FCOE right. data and showed, you guys had a, I don't know, 50, 60% of the market. 60, almost 60. Almost 60. Um, and so, 
it's a key technology. Um, it's really starting to, 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 to uptake now. And we, it's the S-curve, right? We've right. talked about the S-curve. It's flat, and then now it's starting to pick up a little bit. So talk a little bit about what's driving those CNA sales. You're, in, you're second generation, third, third gen almost. Yes. It must yep. be coming soon, so. Right, so second generation. Um, what's really driving it is, once again, it, people want to move to this, right? What's, I, a better question is, what's stopping them from doing it? And I think it's mm -hmm. the newness still. I'm a firm believer that you're starting to see some very large customers who are starting to now show that they're using it. We're starting to come up with a lot of references between us and a lot of our OEM partners. They all sell our technology and they're all driving it. They all might have some unique differences in their solutions, but once again, related to us and our IP, they're all using it maybe in a different way, but it's all driving to the same point of converged networks, right? And I think the key here is that once you start seeing more and more customers implement it and raise their hand and say, hey, I've done this in this type of environment, I've done this environment, you're going to see a lot more people start driving to it. So I definitely believe we're beyond the hype curve. I think people are starting to implement it. And I think this year you'll start seeing a lot more people do it. You mentioned, and I think it's a good point, um, you know, Deloro for the first time actually announced market share data. And we came out very, very well positioned. We're the market leader in that space now. Um, there was other things that were published for a while that our competitors put out and they were saying they were. Well, I think when the numbers really came out, and by the way, we both shared our numbers with Deloro. You know, we were 60% and obviously they were a lot lower. So, you know, once yeah, again. Yeah, she's very credible. I mean, she's, yeah. she's the leader yeah. in that Well, business. and I think the, stra the point is our strategy is working, right? We think it's working, it's driving. Um, you know, it's just a matter of time before people do this. I do want to stress one thing though. You know, we are a firm believer that fiber channel is not going away. Uh, yeah, there is yeah. just too much legacy fiber channel out there today, and FCOE is still pretty new. Um, so it's going to be a slower conversion than I think, but I think somebody who's out building a new data center today, someone putting in a new application, they're all looking at converged networks and saying, does that make sense for this application? Yeah, that's a good point. Wikibon estimates are around 25 billion installed assets in fiber channel, and that's just you know, the infrastructure assets, right. not, let alone the, the processes and the procedures around right. it. It's probably double that. Um, my last question for you, Scott, is can you talk a little bit about the competitive landscape? I mean, you've got you guys, QLogic and Emulex, you know, battling it out, right. you know, good competitors. Then you've got this, the whole Ethernet gang, right? Intel and Broadcom, you've got, you know, Brocade coming in. Brocade, yeah. Talk about um, your positioning. You look very well positioned. Not a lot of gaps in the portfolio. Core switches, maybe. Right. And maybe you want to announce something here in the queue about that. No, okay. <laughs> Come um, on. But talk about why you're well positioned with that, that landscape. Yeah, so I think you got to look at them all a little differently, right? So Broadcom and Intel, obviously more the, what you would call the traditional you know, Ethernet play. I, I think the struggle that they have is that there is this convergence going on, and the convergence means Ethernet and fiber channel. They don't have a fiber channel stack. Um, you know, I think Intel tries to do it through software emulation, you know, the whole bit, but the reality is is that between ourselves and Emulex, there's a huge install base. It's, it's roughly 90 plus percent of that market. Um, there's only a couple companies that have a fiber channel stack. So one of the things I think that they always struggle with or will struggle with, and I think one of the reasons they attempted to go after Emulex was the fact that they needed a fiber channel stack. It wasn't for anything else but that, when you kind of look at it. Broadcom, I, you're talking about. I'm sorry, Broadcom. Right, yeah. yeah, so I think, I think the point there on is that, is that that was a, you know, a proof point of saying how important that fiber channel stack is, because they were willing to go buy a company just to get that, because that was the piece they're missing. And I think they're still missing that. And so as more and more server vendors start implementing FCOE and putting that into their infrastructure, I think it's going to create a problem for Broadcom. I think Intel's the same way, right, in that scenario. Um, I think the other thing too, as we talked about else is that InfiniBand. InfiniBand, we have InfiniBand. Neither one of those guys have that type of technology either. So once again, depending on what a customer wants to do and build, we have that technology. Regarding Emulex, obviously they have a fiber channel stack. Um, I think their struggle is going to be now, they bought a company, they've got to figure out how to merge it together. They've got to figure out how to take technology here and technology here and put it together. While they're doing that, we're continuing to invest in the next generation, the next generation beyond that. Um, we already have a market lead based on the market data. I think it's just going to allow us to continue to go on. It also, I think, validates the fact of our strategy, you know, is the right strategy, and now they've got to figure out how to catch up to that. You're talking about Emulex buying server engines. So, so yes. Broadcom tried to take out Emulex, Emulex right. fought that. Uh, uh, Emulex was getting its IP from server engines, right. had to integrate that because, right. you know, for obvious reasons, right. you got to own your own IP. 
And, 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 all, and, and this is where it comes back to HK's vision. I mean, he saw this five years yes. ago and said, this is what we're doing. So you're not distracted by that stuff now. The, the question, well, I mean, the question on the inside baseball, I mean, is one thing aside. Aside from the server engines, Emulex, QLogic thing, I mean, I think the thing that most data center guys want to know is, you know, these, there's the two horses in the race. And the question that I have is, you guys have a lot of design wins, especially in the area that's kind of forward thinking, very innovative. Right. The ASIC and some of the you know the stack stuff that you mentioned. The, the question is, is that uh, and NetApp brought this up about you know simplicity and and high performance capabilities, being agile. Um, what can you speak to about? Because you're you're in sales and marketing, so you're working on design wins. So right. <laughs> OEMs they work on a, on a lead schedule that's out. Share with us what you can around some of the conversations around what's around the corner that that you can. I mean, obviously simplicity and high performance is what NetApp's driving to, the agile enterprise. What's different about you guys in that context, in these new design wins? Not the, you know, the normal you know, blocking and tackling business. No, I, you know, once again, it's interesting, going back to where we're at today, which is really around virtualization, right? Um, it, as vir every step of virtualization, when you look at the servers, it, it's the new chips. Right, that tends to be the next cycle, as you call that. Chasing the chips. Chasing the chips, yeah. I call it what you want, right? Um, and you know, you need something bigger and faster, lower power, typically, because green is very important in this you know, type of environment we're talking about. And that tends to be you know, a big driver. Our business also is very tied to the, you know, the, the, that piece of the business, right? Because when that gets upgraded, then of course, once again, having the right kind of bandwidth to be able to connect through is important. Server refresh, you know? yeah, baby. Well, yeah, no, but it's, it's an important piece, right? And I think, I think it's an important driver. So a lot of, you know, when you start talking to the OEMs and our customers, a lot of them are tied to those types of, you know, cycles as we start building it. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I think you're going to see, and I think I mean, you- their use case, so talk about the use case. What do they want? They want what? They want faster, smaller, cheaper, or they, inexpensive, Well, right? they do, right? You know, better power, power is key. You know, it's really important, green initiative. We don't hear a lot about it as much, it seems like, in the last six months. But when you go out and talk to customers, power issues are big still, and virtualization really helps them, you know, maximize the assets they have to be able to go do that, right? I'll tell you what you hear it a lot is in the cloud service guys. No, Every one of them no, we've no, had no on question. here. Power, power, power. Cooling, power, cooling, cooling. power is important, right? Yeah. You know, cloud, cloud's really interesting, you yeah. know, I think when you look at it across the board. Yeah, yeah, and, and by the way, I think if you t looked at most of our customers, they're all looking at cloud initiatives. Um, I think, and it's funny, I, we were just walking on the floor in here and it seemed like every other booth had the word cloud in it. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> cloud what, angle. I'm not sure. By, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cloud. not sure if they all mean the same thing, but definitely they're all out there talking about it. But there's definitely a space for that, especially when you talk about storage. But now think of it this way. Now you're talking about cloud storage. So it's no longer in the next room, the storage. It's off somewhere. So what do you need? You need, God, virtualization. you need virtualization and you need really fast you know, connectivity to make sure well, that that's you That's what can always struggled with me. It. That's what always par was the paradox for me was, okay, storage is always like a tightly physically located box. You have you know, the technologies to make the data transfer work, you know, high integrity. Uh, but now with that spanned out, you got you know, vMotion, you got all these technologies moving things around, you got mobile devices, data, data, data. Is that the, uh, the fundamental vision of the company that the ASIC and this flex fabric will address? Is that the key is, or is it something else? Once again, our strategy is to work and give technology into our OEMs. The OEMs are the ones that ultimately, you know, our customers and our partners are ultimately going to have to decide what direction they want to go. We just want to make sure that every type of networking protocol that they might need, we can supply for them. I mean, I, you know, I, sound, I know it sounds pretty simple, but we're not a one niche, one, you know, type of technology. We've got it across the board. And we feel that when we look at our complete you know, uh, bandwidth of you know, solutions, that we have the capability of offering something to all of them to build out. Now, I'm not sure if I'm here to say that this company A is going to come out with the right one versus company yeah. B versus away. company C, but at the end of the day, I want A, B, and C, if they need what we sell, I want them all to implement it into other solutions. That's our model, that's what we do. We don't compete with our, our partners. And by the way, you mentioned uh, Brocade earlier. Um, you know, I think one of the things Brocade's going to have to struggle with is that clearly they've bought a, you know, Ethernet switching company. It puts them right in the bullseye of, you know, the big guy Cisco and probably a lot of the smaller guys. Um, and I think that's going to be a struggle with them. Is you think that's a write-off for them? They're like, they're like looking at us. Okay, we want to compete on the server side. They're letting go of the low end. Uh, uh, 
you know, I, I'm not sure. You're not uh, you know, right uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. We're we're having success, obviously, with our you know switches and what we're doing. But I think the point is, is that you know, so you know, some of these companies like HP went off and bought a company. So now, if you look at it, who does HP compete with in that space? Brocade, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Cisco. by the way, Cisco. So no longer partners there, right? Yeah. Cisco came out with uh, you know servers. They're competing. This whole landscape is radically changing. So when you go back to HK's vision, what is it? We want to make sure that we have the technology to be able to you know, give or support into our partners and not compete with them, right? How do we do that? How do we help them build solutions to go drive you know, to meet customers' demands? I yeah, think that's I mean, the key. I mean, you, know, you talk about Brocade, they obviously had a great run. You know, they helped, oh. helped develop the whole SAN, they got good technology, right. really focused, but it's hard to see where it, where it goes from here. And, and uh, I think you guys are, are very well positioned, and and that transformation of the brand into the data center is is an interesting dynamic. Um, Q Logic likes the hard stuff, right? And you do the hard stuff well, the stuff that a lot of people don't want to do, or doesn't make business sense for them to do. As I said, that's why <laughs> yeah, yeah. the server company doesn't want to buy Brocade because they'll be selling to all their competitors, and nobody will buy from them. I, so I was right. talking to an executive from a big networking company, and I can't say the name of it, but. Uh, I'm like, hey, you know, hey, like that QLogic uh, stories on the blog. And I'm like, oh, cool, what do you think? I mean, I like these guys, uncovered their new direction, like it, innovative. I go, I go, what do you think? Are you guys going to do something in the area? <laughs> she rolled her eyes and said, that stuff's way too hard. <laughs> 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 it's like, you know, they have their own agenda, right? So like, for them, it's like, great, no problem. We're happy to just work with guys who know it right. and do it, support it, supply it. And to them, it's like it works, <laughs> they'll pay the margins, you know, and just move on with their products. So it's a real testament to you guys. Yep. So uh, m and is hot, cloud m and although Tom Georgian says, interesting, 3 pars not about the cloud, but, you know, hey, they've marketed it as such, and that's how everybody's reporting that's, it, that's and his, he's that's probably his, right. But, that's a story you know, sticking to it. It's a good, it's a good hype. Um, but so, you know, you've been in the business for a while. What do you think of that whole, whole 3 par thing? It's, uh, Pretty interesting. Yeah, 3 par has been around for a while. It's a great company. Yeah. I think if you look at their install base, they've got some great customers. So, um, it, you know, I'm actually kind of surprised that someone hasn't taken them earlier. So, but maybe it's the it's time. It's a good price they got it's, now, it's, $2 it, billion. Yeah, yeah, it's the time now and, uh, you know, good for 3PAR. I think it's great for them. It validates what they did. Um, I think most people know, uh, you know, I used to work for a storage company and I think there was a point we used to very much discount three, our, uh, thin provisioning. And that was kind of three parts claim to fame. And I think that's what helped build their company up and gave them the credibility they needed. And clearly what happened was the big boys finally came out with it. I don't think they came out with it quite as well as three part did it. But I think that... Um, well, you know how it is. When you start with a fundamental architecture, you know, build it around an ASIC and, and that's your whole you know, raison d'etre, it makes a better product. And There's no question. That's what happened. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. I, also. Once again, and it's interesting, you can, it, it, maybe it's, it's a theme around virtualization, even though it's not, but it's really around simplification, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you reduce cost? And, you know, three parts whole story was around what? You know, trying to reduce the no amount of, you know, terabytes that you had to buy. And if you're a big boy, you know, we'll leave their names out of it, but, you know, we all know who the big storage companies are. Who's next? Who do you, you know? think is going to go next? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but no, but my point is, is that if you, were, if you were a big storage company going into your install yeah, base yeah, well, and trying to convince yeah, yeah, yeah. them to buy 20 or 30% less yeah. because you can implement this make less money. Right? didn't make sense. That's mm -hmm. why you need startups like 3PAR, you know, to come out with some of that innovation and drive it in the industry. And I think they yeah. did a good job with that. And, it's you know, great point. Good, good for them. And, you yeah. know, hopefully... Uh, That's a key theme of this conference that, that I was looking for was, you know, what's the angle on the startup community? And it's, you know, unanimous across the board from Pat Gelsinger down to the VCs uh, and, and our guests that, you know, startups are very much in a good position to capture some white space, um, which is a small segment for the big guys, but a big segment for a startup. So, you know, we're expecting to see and cover ton of startups coming out doing things different yeah I think I think startups um, are, they're almost the incubator now for some of these bigger companies right you know they, they yeah. go out they they sample it they play with it they get it to work and they get to a certain size and you know most of them get gobbled up right and uh, liquidity IBM, uh, is there uh, yeah. I mean liquidity is no real IPO market so you know Pat, jo Tom Georgian said this now that not everyone can do R&D so I agree with you there. Yeah, right. I mean, IBM just completed the acquisition of StoreWise this right. week, right? It's, it's a company with maybe $3 million in revenue, so over $140 million. And because people realize that you, the point you were talking about earlier, Scott, all this data, we got to compress it. And even after we compress it, we still got to jam it through the pipe. And even after we do that, 
We still need bigger pipes. And no it's question just about it. Never ending. So Q Logic's pretty well positioned from that standpoint. Yes. There's a lot. There's a lot of data being created all well, the time. Rising tide floats all boats in cloud, and a lot of from up and down the stack into you know virtualization at the server, storage, I/O, big right. store. You guys are a big part of it. Uh, uh, we're here at Silicon Angle's continuous coverage of the Cube at VMworld Live 2010 with Scott Genero, who's the senior vice president of sales and marketing at Q Logic. Thanks so much for uh, joining Thank us you. and sharing your uh, opinions and analysis. Yeah, and it was commentary. great to have you on. It was a rare, rare, long segment in the schedule where we didn't have a back-to-back-to-back, <laughs> -to -back -to -back, <laughs> so we appreciate you spending <laughs> a little extra time with Thank us you. talking about the industry, yeah. a great perspective. Great. Thanks. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. We'll be right back. We're going to go to a break and then come back with some news. Um, so come right back uh, this afternoon. Thank you.